Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back with some actual outside racing. Check it out. This is from before the whole coronavirus thing. And um, fans of the channel should recognize this course. Yes, this is Alviso. Man, I miss this group of friends. I miss just racing my bike in general, but also just the uh, the social part of it and the camaraderie. So anyway, um, thought I'd mix up some of the, the Zwift live streaming that I've been doing with some actual outside racing. And I got a treat for you today. This is a, this is a good one. I left on a high note from Alviso, so let's just dive right into it. Okay, so we're about halfway through the race now. It was a pretty mellow first half of the race, but I knew that wouldn't last. You're going to start to see a theme here. There's SJBC on the attack, and it's the same duo. It's Brian and Zach doing the, the attack counterattack thing, which is frustrating. And that's, that's a good thing. That's a compliment to the tactics they're using. If your competition's frustrated, you're probably doing something right. You're going to see Brian uh, goes off the front. Makes me do this little effort. I think he realizes that uh, his breakaway mate up there um, is kind of done taking a pole. And then good a time as any for Zach to do the counter. So this is just good timing. This is just good bike racing. That's kind of a bummer because that one's got Chuck in it. And I can't let those two guys get away. Oh, plus Tuna was just brought back. So this is, this is really threatening because with two riders off the front who can ride away from 15Ks out and then not as many riders to chase, I definitely have to respond to this one. Remember, if you're doing an effort on the front, like what I'm going to do here in a second, especially into a headwind, there has to be a good reason for it. Like, for example, if this was just a, a single rider who wasn't on uh, Team San Jose Bike Club, SJBC, then I wouldn't feel obligated to make this effort. And that's because SJBC, having uh, a few riders in the field, would have an obligation to chase that back um, unless they want to lose. So you should always be asking yourself that question at any moment in the race, especially when there's a group off the front. Questions like, will that group go the distance? If they do have the capability to go the distance, who is going to be responsible for chasing it back? And in a situation like this, it's really obvious. So the decision is really easy that I have to do an effort here. Sometimes it's not so obvious, and you have to kind of roll the dice. It depends on how you're feeling that day, what kind of efforts you've done leading up to that point, and it's really dynamic. It's what I love about this sport. There's no Sometimes there, there's an easy answer, and sometimes it's not so easy, and um, that's what makes the strategy so dynamic and so important. Well, I got a little long-winded there, so let's just cut forward and, until when the catch is made. And I know that Brian is on my wheel, the teammate of Zach, and I know this counterattack is coming. But this funny thing happens. There's a little bit of confusion between the two SJBC guys. Like, okay, who's going to counter Jeff in this situation? And they both kind of look back, and there's a lull for a second. So I'm just going to sit on their wheel, and I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to follow here because it seems like they both want to put in an effort right here. The field is strung out. I did an effort to chase Zach back. Brian didn't really counter, and you can see we've, now we're slowing down quite a bit. And with Zach stuck on the front, who was just off the front, like, I'm just going to go. Because somebody's got to attack right there. And, and you know, with something with a move like this, I'm not going to go for 14 kilometers by myself. I've mentioned this before on my channel. Um, you guys probably know this about me. This isn't really my strong suit. I'm not just a sustained power watts per kilo type of rider. I like the surges and speed. I like the sprints. So this the reason for this wasn't to to get away, and that was that was the move of the day. It was to prevent having to respond to a counter from either the SJBC riders or somebody else in the field because that was a moment where somebody had to do something and I put in an effort Zach had to chase it back so it's kind of a wash I did an effort Zach did an effort to chase me and now um, what ended up happening is uh, that split the field because like I said it came right off the heels of um, a lot of uh, attack counterattack racing leading into that so this is this is kind of an important part of the race I've realized that uh that there's a split now behind. And the problem, though, is this front group is a little bit too big, and I haven't broken up the SJBC duo, so I still have to contend with that potential attack-counterattack uh, game. And then, sure enough, here comes Brian. It was a really well-timed attack, but I was ready for it. I had saw, I had saw him coming from a mile, a mile back, and I was able to respond to it. I was able to preempt it with some power. So he wasn't able to get that big speed differential. That's what you're looking for in a successful attack is a big speed differential. And he tries again right there a little bit, but now he's, he's lacking that element of surprise. So this isn't going to uh, work, especially in a headwind. So now the issue we're having, um, is, like I was saying, is this front split, this group, is too big to be a breakaway. Like, there's no way that, you know, 10 riders are all going to work together in a breakaway. That's just not going to happen. 
And you see immediately Jerome goes off the front. He probably recognizes that that's going to be an issue. So what's going to happen right here? Nine times out of ten, there's going to be a breakaway from this breakaway. Th this, there's a sweet spot of like two to six riders, I want to say, for breakaways to be successful. And, hey, coming back to the tip I told you guys earlier, if you don't have an obligation to ride hard on the front, don't ride hard on the front. You saw both San Jose Bike Club guys missed those three riders that all jumped off the front. I'm going to make them do some work to bring that back. Because if I if I bring it back, first of all, it'd, it'd be a really hard effort. And second of all, once I make it, they would just immediately counter me. So you have to plan ahead. You have to think about it. And see, you, you can tell now, I think I said the <laughs> this front split was 10 riders. It looks like it's more like 15 or 20. But this is, this is the predictable chaos that's going to happen until things settle down, until a group coalesces that is all going to work uh, well together in a group of probably two to six riders. And it takes until about nine kilometers to go. I was able for the last couple of kilometers to sit back, chill, surf wheels. You can see my heart rate is, has come down 149. It's pretty modest. But now I have to respond because there's an SJBC rider off the front. And that's why... That's why there's a gap opening up, and that's why Zach isn't doing any work. So I reach out here, do a hard effort. I have to put in a hard dig because Brian was on my wheel. He's no dummy. He knows I'm going to have to chase that back. And this is the front of me. The big Brian Larson move is when the brake's about to get caught, attack through it. And that's what I do. But once I realize that Brian's on my wheel, I, um, I stop putting the power down. But, but check it out. Here goes Zach with a big counter, and I have to respond to that 1,200 watts. Ouch. That stings. But I, I can't let these guys get away now inside of 10 kilometers to go because I don't want to be put in a position where I'm chasing. And right now, what would hurt most? Yeah, you guessed it. Here comes Brian with, with the counter. And you got to commit 100% to this attack counterattack stuff. So this is a good job by San Jose, again, forcing me to do these efforts. And look at that. A second ago, I, was, I was, said my heart rate was at 149, pretty low. And we're already back up to 168. And I think one or two more of these probably would have would have done me in. I think Zach probably should have committed to one more really hard one here just to see where I'm at, to see if he could open a gap because it probably would have worked. Instead, Tracy goes, boom, in the green web core kit. We've talked about Tracy before. He is, uh, he, he's strong, especially from this distance. And um, this is threatening. But I'm, again, I'm going to lean on SJBC for missing and I'm going to make sure that, that they're going to do work to bring it back and I'm not going to overcommit here to, um, to bringing Tracy back myself. I'm going to I'm going to keep a, a, a decent power here just to make sure it doesn't get too out of control, but I'm going to lean on SJBC as much as possible to bring that back. And sure enough, just a few hundred meters later, you see Zach checking over his shoulder right there. I forced him to the front, and there he goes with the boom, the big, panicky, massive attack to try to bring Tracy back here inside of seven kilometers to go. And this is into a headwind. This is great news for me because I'm going to be able to sit into a draft here. I'm getting like a half draft right now, but... But Zach is, is, without a doubt, doing a much harder effort here than I am. And I was predicting that that might be the case, and that's why holding a really good position in those critical moments where you anticipate something big is going to happen is super important. There's times in a race where you can chill. A lot of people who um, don't race much think that the whole entire race start to finish is like full gas, but that's not the case. I mean, you can boil down those critical moments just to just a handful of moments, but, but the important part is recognizing those moments and reading the race in the in-between calm moments. Like, you can never just turn your brain off. And speaking of which, here's a small gap that Zach's opened up with, with Chris, so this, this immediately has to be shut down. Again, Tracy's still off the front, so, so there, is a, there is panic going on now. You see these gaps opened up. My heart rate's jacked up. And I haven't even been on, on the front. I've been, for the most part, in, in draft. So, um, actually, I'm going to pause it right here. You know, I talk about these critical moments in a race a lot in my videos. And I want to, like, just put an emphasis on this one. Think about this moment right here. If you don't like your chances in a field sprint, this is a perfect time for a counterattack. Like, you couldn't script this time any better for a counterattack. And I don't know why I'm telling you this. I'm basically telling you, as a field sprinter myself, what would annoy me most. Um, think about it. There's been an attack, there's been a counterattack, there's been a counter to the counterattack, and so on. Everybody at the front has done efforts in the wind and is just dead tired. They're slowing down, there's a lull on the front, there's riders about 10 wheels back who are getting slingshot towards the front of the race, probably going 5 miles an hour faster than we are. You couldn't set up a better time to, to launch a winning attack if you tried. But there's nothing. And I happily get to rest, catch my breath, and get ready for the field sprint, which is uh, in less than, than six kilometers now. All right, here we go. Last lap and a half. 
Now, as a field sprinter, I like my chances out of this group, and it should be no surprise that from here on out, I'm going to be saving as much energy as possible until about 250 meters to go. And as I say that, there goes Big Tuna with the attack. And from three and a half kilometers to go, this is pretty threatening, I'm not going to lie. Even sitting here in an office chair, I am worried about this attack, because three and a half kilometers for Tuna is, is a very reasonable distance for him to, to go. And the way this works is if there's confusion behind, there's hesitation behind, and that's what he preys on. And coming into one to go, that's the best timing for this, this sort of attack because that's oftentimes when there is some hesitation. Everyone's kind of saving their legs for the finale, right? Makes sense. What I'm doing is I'm leaning on SJBC because it's worked in the past, but I've kind of worn that, I've kind of played that card too many times. And here's where I really roll the dice is Zach goes, and instead of just jumping on immediately, I, I let this gap open a little bit. And that's because I want to make sure these other people are chasing. I want to slot in in good position. But I'm playing the game, and this is a dangerous game because now they've got, f what, three, four seconds. And as soon as I'm about ready to put my head down and just smash across and use up my sprint, here comes Big Larry Nolan to the rescue. Kind of saving my, saving my skin here. And I'm just going to sit in the draft. It's a good, uh, good stiff tailwind. He does this hard effort. We're going 33 miles an hour. And I'm getting a good draft from Larry. So this is a solid bro move by him. And now we're back. Again, another moment right here. He even does the little track handoff. Pretty classy rider, that Larry. Um, again, if, you, if you're not interested in a field sprint, if you don't like your chances in a field sprint, that would have been another really good opportunity to do a counter right after Larry made the connection because the front riders are tired from that, uh, that attack they all just put in. Larry's tired because he just bridged across. Um, I'm probably going to be pretty reluctant to chase because... I'm waiting for 250 meters to go. So that would have been a pretty good time. And, and again, I'm just telling you as a field sprinter what would annoy me the most, and that would have been a big counterattack right there that I would have um, been forced to respond to. And you can see we're, we're going 21 miles an hour. So that's another big reason why a big counterattack right there would have worked because there was a natural slowing down. And I think this, this comes with just race awareness and experience, like noticing those moments when things slow down, when an attack, a big counterattack works the best. And that's uh, when there's a big speed differential on, on the front. That's the, the way to uh, successfully get a gap. But now we're back on the gas. It looks like somebody's doing an effort on the front. And um, I kind of lost a wheel there a little bit. But that was uh, at the cost of moving back because I really want to be in, like, position number eight or so. And that's where I am right here. What is that, eight, seventh, or eighth, something like that? I am really liking my position right here. Basically, I'm trying to be a ghost until... Uh, 250 meters to go, right? I don't want to do any efforts in the wind. And I also don't want to have to respond to any uh, potential uh, late late stage breakaways here. So, so I'm trying to remember what I did here. Okay, so I let I let Tim back in. Tim wanted back in. By all means, I'm I'm letting Tim back in, reinforcing my good position right here, staying away from the front. I don't want to be too close to the front. I also want to be too far uh, towards the back. CSJBC is moving up into position. Zach's still in front of me. Now he's got his teammate in the blue there who's moving up to try to support him for the sprint. Really liking my position right here. It's looking really good for me to hit the front at 250 meters to go and take uh, take the field sprint. But I'm going to pause it right here. I want you to check this out. So, so Tuna just finished his poll. And stuck on the front is Zach, Jerome, and like three other sprinters who, who are all just going to be waiting for the field sprint. And I know I was just telling you guys that I, too, want to wait until about 250 meters to go. That's where I win most of my races. But about one kilometer to go, I'm carrying some speed past these front riders who are all looking at each other. The timing was just too perfect. So, boom, I just go for it. This definitely wasn't something I was planning. And, and to make this work from 900 meters out, the first thing you have to do is get a gap. Like, you can't just lead it out and tow everyone to the line if you want to win the race. And the other big mistake that you can make in this in this situation is just by going way too hard too early. You have to try to smooth that effort out and just be completely empty by the time you get to the line. So if you watch my shadow, I looked back once before this corner. And really, I'm waiting for the tailwind. I'm trying to stay seated and arrow as, as best as possible through here. And you can see my gap's not great. I really want to I really want to practice better social distancing through here. <laughs> and... Uh, and this is the first time that I stand up um, after I make the initial attack. And I do, a, I do a little surge in power right here because I just I want to discourage them to close those last like three seconds. I just want to open that back up again. I sit back down and 
Now I'm just basically tunnel vision, running on fumes, just just hoping I can get to the line. And no more looking back from here. I'm just head down. Lactic acid is coming out of my eyeballs. I'm basically just getting as arrow as possible in the, in the last few meters, making sure I can preserve my speed because I'm not really able to put out any more power than this. And it was enough. You know, not my usual thing, but always keep your competition on their toes and, and try new things. This is a practice crit after all. So thanks again for watching, guys. And man, I just miss bike racing so much. So hopefully we can get back out there soon and see you guys at the next one.